This video is from a study that was published yesterday, October 13th, and it is honestly one of the most bizarre studies I have ever seen. Vertebrates have evolved several different ways of supplementing their body with oxygen through the skin, using lungs, using gills. Frogs use all three of these methods at different points in their life, but what they don't use is photosynthesis. A scientist that was studying the oxygen consumption of African clawed frogs was having a lunch discussion with a botanist when the question arose, could we use science to create frogs that could breathe using photosynthesis from other cyanobacteria or green algae? So to test it, they literally injected the tadpole's heart with cyanobacteria and green algae. As you can see in this video, it then spread through the vascular system. So they put these tadpoles in water and slowly depleted the oxygen. When there was too little oxygen, the tadpoles essentially died. It was at that moment that they illuminated the tadpoles and the chlorophyll got to work, providing the tadpole brain with oxygen. So as crazy as it sounds, they might actually be onto something here. Now this is considered a proof of principle experiment, just showing that there is reason to research it further. We are nowhere near seeing this applied in practical purposes. So if we live in an underground bunker, why on earth would we ever need a 72 hour kit? Well, I'll tell you. But first off, if you don't know what a 72 hour kit is, it's basically just a grab to go emergency kit that will last you 72 hours. The bag should have everything you might need in that kind of emergency situation and should be light enough that one person can carry it. But if we live in an underground nuclear bunker, why would we ever leave during the emergency? Well, in most situations, we probably wouldn't be. We'd probably just bunker down and hold tight, but there are a few rare or extreme situations where we would want to leave. If the bunker was compromised in any way, or if we needed to rendezvous with someone for whatever reason, the 72 hour kit is extremely useful. If there is a black hole with the mass of the Earth, how big would it be? Gotcha. Okay, so we have to do a couple of calculations. So all you do is you set these two equal to each other and solve for R. Let's do that. This is called the short shield radius, the classical short shield radius. If you place the mass of the Earth in this equation, right? you'll calculate how big it is. <laughs> and then uh, we need the mass of the Earth. The mass of the Earth is approximately 5.9 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And then it's easy. It says 12, but 12 is like 10, <laughs> right? So it's really 10. One centimeter, so if you took the Earth if you took the Earth and and compressed it down to uh, to one centimeter, it will become a black hole. Yeah, a classical black hole. I didn't take into account all kinds of relativistic effects. This was just a classical calculation. The actual answer is 1.7. We got one centimeter, which is off by a factor of two. Which I said before, in astronomer circles, uh, it means you basically got the right answer. <laughs> With a factor of two, is great. <laughs> the coolest animal you probably haven't heard of the Glaucus Atlanticus. Just look at this thing. It's also sometimes called the blue sea dragon, the sea swallow, or the dragon slug. So these creatures are technically a shellless gastropod mollusk, a type of nudibranch. You can find them off the coast of South Africa, the east coast of Australia, and some European waters. The Glaucus is pelagic. They float using the surface tension of the water, and they're carried along by the currents or winds. But the coolest thing about them is this. They prey on other floaty pelagic creatures, including the Portuguese man of war, which is a creature which has a particularly nasty sting. And what they do is they absorb the sting, the poison, from these creatures. Specifically Specifically, they store the nematocysts, which are like the little stingy bits, within their own tissues to use as a defense against predators. Which is why you shouldn't really pick one up if you ever see one, because it might be like actually touching a Portuguese man of war jellyfish. I just think it's nice to know that there's at least one other creature in nature which, when encountering a toxic enemy, absorbs that toxicity within itself and uses it as a defense mechanism to prevent anything else from getting close to it. This is an Euler disc. It's perfectly balanced and quite heavy. It demonstrates the conservation of angular momentum and energy nicely. As it slowly damps down, the frequency of oscillation continues to increase. Wait for it.
Physics is fun. This is a skull from a marlin, a giant predatory. Wait, 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 what's this? What, what is this? See this strange ball in its eye? This is called a scleral ring. It's an eye bone. Notice how it's the perfect shape to fit inside an eyeball. It supports the eye from the intense water pressure it experiences while the marlin swims in the ocean. So marlins have bones in their eyeballs. There's a moon in our solar system that's so wonky that scientists call it the Frankenstein world. It's a moon of Uranus and it's called Miranda. Miranda is really small. It's only a seventh of the size of our moon, but it has canyons 12 times deeper than the Grand Canyon. In fact, it has the tallest cliff of anywhere in the solar system. The weirdest part about Miranda is it has these three giant grooved shapes. Why? We don't know. <laughs> It's possible that the moon was smashed apart in some colossal collision and the pieces were Frankensteined back together. Some scientists think that meteorites pelted Miranda and ice underneath the surface melted, came to the top and refroze like this. Some researchers think that the gravitational pull of Uranus was so strong that it heated up the inside of Miranda, causing its insides to churn. Also, we've only ever seen one half of this moon. This is an invisibility shield. Now, it looks like a piece of plastic that doesn't do much. It basically uses lenticular lenses to bend light around the subject. So, watch me stand behind this and my legs completely disappear. Pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna call my dog. I'm gonna hide right here to see if he can see me. Obi! Ah, <laughs> there I am. Did I fool you? Did I fool you? Like and subscribe if you wanna see more videos. I need to buy a little bit of mineral oil because my tank is looking a little bit empty. Last one, perfect. We're back home, let's open up this mineral oil. Got that off. All right, we got our mineral oil PC here. Let's uh, pour this in. Come on, Gerald. And just because I know it makes you guys mad, right into the ports of the graphics card. We're not stopping there either. We're going with the motherboard too. Everything getting hit today. The aux jacks. Oh yeah. And to finish off, right on the wires. There we go. And there we go. The new and improved mineral oil PC. The hardest creative job in the world has to be being a manga artist for Weekly Shonen Jump. So you probably know manga as Japanese comics or graphic novels. You've probably seen volumes of them in bookstores, but what you probably don't know is the insane conditions in which a lot of manga is made. It's just unreal. Before they're published in volumes, manga chapters are typically published in monthly or weekly magazines. And the most popular of these is Weekly Shonen Jump. To give you a sense of how thick it is, this is the first Harry Potter book, and uh, yeah. The reason why it's so thick is twofold. Firstly, in every weekly issue, there's a new chapter from the 20 or so ongoing different series that Weekly Shonen Jump is publishing at any given moment in time. And each one of those series typically has one person who is the primary author and artist for every single chapter. And secondly, each chapter is expected to be between 15 to 20 pages long. And this is published weekly, 48 weeks a year. So in order to achieve that sheer volume of output, these manga artists have to work monstrous schedules. Some have actually published their routines online. It's not uncommon for them to sleep three to six hours a night, working up to 18 hours a day for the bulk of their week. And here's the thing, most manga artists in Weekly Shonen Jump keep the schedule up, almost entirely uninterrupted, for years. Some have managed it for decades. The most popular manga in Shonen Jump right now, and indeed the entire world, is a pirate manga called One Piece. And it's been running since July of 1997. The author started it when he was 22 years old. He is 46 now, and still continuing the same story. And the longest running series in Jump ever ran for 40 years. And if all of that wasn't crazy enough, the series in Weekly Shonen Jump are in a way competing with one another. Every week, Shonen Jump solicits feedback from its audience to assess how each series is doing, how popular it is, and it will rank them. And if your series is consistently not doing well, 
Shonen Jump will cancel it. So not only do you have to keep up with this relentless pressure, you also have to be better than the other world-class artists that are in the same competition as you. And all of this absurd pressure aside, we haven't even talked about the creative insanity that is this process. These authors can't spend weeks drafting ideas. Imagine trying to write a book whereby every week you'd have to submit 18 completely finalized pages linearly over the course of six months. How much harder would that be? And the most remarkable thing, despite all of this, is that some of the stories published weekly in this magazine are nothing short of masterful. Sure, they have assistants to do some background work and to help with inking and some character drawing, and they have an editor to sort of help them lay out the story, but ultimately these artists shoulder almost the entire creative burden of their particular series. I think it's obvious that the conditions in which this magazine sets up for its authors are not ideal, to say the least. Thankfully, the industry seems to be changing to accommodate for more breaks and more flexible schedules. But for me, knowing how these stories are made simply adds to the aura experience while reading them. It's just incredible. And that's why 